Hello again, viewers. Thank you for joining me. This review is going to start out a little bit differently because this is my first request. So thank you, CubeSolver64, for introducing me to Zoids. I sent you a message personally, but I'll say it again here. I'll be reviewing each half separately, and for this first half at least, there will be spoilers. For those, like myself not so long ago, who may not know, Zoids is listed as one anime, but it's split in half. Chaotic Century covers episodes 1 through 34, and 35 through 67 is Guardian Force. It didn't take long to see that the Zoids story is very... busy. There's just too much to discuss to try and cram all 67 episodes into one review. So, onwards. Zoids takes place on Planet Z. I found that the mechanics of this world weren't always explained very well, and there were a few things that never got a proper explanation at all. Zoids are machines. Sort of. Humans pilot them to make everyday tasks easier, but mostly to fight each other. But there's also been talk of the Zoids being influenced by their pilots' emotions or spiritual energy, and our heroes encounter a few unmanned Zoids roaming the desert, so even regular Zoids seem to be alive to some extent. There are also beings called Organoids, and I'm much more bothered by the lack of a real definition here. Over the course of our heroes' journeys, they run into people hunting organoids, people who say organoids are things of legend, and people who don't even believe organoids really exist. But no one ever stops to actually explain to the audience what an organoid is. The best I have been able to figure thus far is that organoids are clearly sentient creatures that can fuse with regular zoids to make them more powerful. Anyway, backing up a little. Zoid's Chaotic Century follows a boy named Van. He's out exploring the desert one day when he runs into a group of bandits. While hiding in some old ruins, he comes across two mysterious pods. One contains an organoid, which he names Zeke, and the other holds a girl with amnesia, who they decide to call Fiona. They also find an abandoned shield liger out in the desert, which should be a dream come true for Van. His father died a hero, and ever since, it's been his goal to become a Zoid pilot himself. However, the first few episodes introduce something I came to really like about this series right away. It's pretty dark for a kid's show, and they don't try to dumb down the danger. The bandits follow Van and Fiona back to his village in the hopes of capturing the organoid. Realizing that having Zeke around makes them a target, Van chooses to leave home and roam the desert with Fiona, searching for some clue about who she is. They soon run into our two other heroes. One is Irvine, an older boy who's also roaming the deserts for reasons that are never really explained. He's also looking for an organoid, presumably just to make him a stronger Zoid pilot, but his attempts to steal Zeke never really go anywhere. Irvine joins the gang when they run into another friend of his. Moonbay is a girl who transports equipment and supplies across the desert for anyone who'll pay her. Moonbay quickly became one of my favorite characters. Definitely one of the good guys, but her morals were not always what they could have been. Moonbay's inclusion is what gets our heroes involved in the real plot. Planet Z is in the middle of a war between the Empire and the Republic. Our heroes try to stay out of it at first, but practically every other episode they're being arrested and locked up by one side or the other. It's during one of their arrests that Moonbay strikes a deal with the Republican army. One of the things I really liked about Zoids was that there was no clear right side. Our heroes start out on the side of the Republic, but the first war is over by episode 18. The Imperial Army surrenders and agrees to leave the Republic alone when their Emperor suddenly dies, leaving his ten-year-old grandson, Prince Rudolph, as the rightful heir. And he's immediately kidnapped, so our heroes spend roughly the next 15 episodes helping the Crown Prince of the Empire return home. Remember how I said this show was very busy? Even with just a basic explanation of the story, there are a few things I have to go back to. So remember those bandits at the very beginning of the story? 
The soldiers quickly become the real threats, but the bandits continue to show up and cause trouble. At first, I thought they were meant to be comic relief villains, you know, because they were never very successful, but two of them in particular, Rosso and Viola, soon become pretty important characters. The other important plot point is that, from the very beginning, the Imperial Army has trouble from the inside. They become pretty evenly split between those who support the late Emperor and Prince Rudolf, who want peace, and those who support a man named General Prozen, who believes it's in the Empire's best interest to crush the Republic so there is only one country and they have total control. Almost immediately after the ceasefire, Prozen arranges to have Rudolf kidnapped and killed and to blame it on the Republic. That way he would become Emperor and they'd have a reason to go to war again. Except... Rosso breaks out of prison and he had his own plans to kidnap the Prince. But Rosso and Viola take a shine to Rudolf when they realize his own people tried to assassinate him. They have a short stint as a happy pseudo-family, but soon enough the plot catches back up with them, and Rosso and Viola sacrifice themselves to save Rudolph. Or so it seems, anyway. It is revealed later that they survive and go on to help Rudolph from the shadows, and to be honest, I was kind of disappointed. I suppose I shouldn't be too surprised, this is still a show aimed at children, but a noble sacrifice like that would have been a really good end to a pair of characters that I had pretty low expectations for. Anyway, there's also the matter of Fiona. With everything else going on here, Fiona's story tends to get shunted to the background. On a few different occasions, she's shown to be a little bit psychic, aware of things that go beyond regular human senses. On a few different cases, our heroes explore old ruins, and Fiona goes into a trance of sorts, and just a few words or memories will come back to her. The first time sends our heroes searching for something called Zoid Eve, a mystery that's not resolved by the end of Season 1. The second time alerts our heroes to the existence of the Death Sorrow, a legendary monster Prozen is trying to resurrect. Fiona gets all of her memories back when Zeke is almost destroyed. It turns out she's a survivor of a race known as the Ancient Zoidians, which was almost destroyed by the Death Sorrow, and her name is actually Elise Lynette. As can be expected, our heroes defeat Prozen and Rudolph takes the throne, but they still haven't really addressed the matter of Fiona, and I can only hope it takes more precedence in part two. So. After that extremely long overview, there are a few things I want to discuss. This request was left on one of my Digimon reviews, and it actually came out the same year as Adventure. I wasn't aware of Zoids as a child, but it struck me as the kind of show I would have watched dubbed, no matter the quality of that dub. So that's what I did, and I have to say, the dub wasn't great. I'm not even sure I'd call it good. The main cast isn't too bad, or at the very least I got used to it, but throughout, just about everyone's lines came out sounding flat and awkward. On the other hand, I really liked the music in Zoids. The opening and ending, not so much. It's a pretty generic tune where they just shout Zoids over and over again over an action-y background piece, but all the background tracks were catchy and easy on the ears, and most importantly, fit well with their scenes. Whoever was in charge of the music knew what they were doing. Which isn't something I can say for Digimon if you want to keep that comparison going. And the last point for this review is the characters. I've already touched on Fiona, Irvine, and Moonbay a little, so that just leaves three others. First is Prince Rudolph. He's incredibly wise and level-headed for a ten-year-old, and he grows a lot during his time on the run. When he's finally returned to the Empire, he's a lot braver, and while I love a good war story, I hope his leadership means part two can focus more on the other characters. Then finally, there's Van, and our main protagonist is connected to one other character. But to start, Van is pretty much the epitome of your childhood action cartoon. Brave, energetic, good-hearted. I think he's supposed to be 14. 
The dub tries to pass him off as 17, but honestly, I would have pegged him closer to 12. And the last character I want to discuss is Raven, a boy who is clearly meant to be Van's foil. They look to be about the same age, and Raven is the only other character with an organoid, but they use their power in very different ways. Once Van realizes what he can do with Zeke, he immediately searches for someone he can protect with that power. Raven kinda just destroys everything to prove he's the strongest. He's technically working for General Prozen, but it's clear he feels no real loyalty to the Imperial Army. He's just as likely to attack his own backup if he thinks they're getting in his way. Van and Raven have one final battle in Part 1 that ends up destroying Raven's Zoid, but I hope he makes a reappearance in Part 2. Raven's presence continually pushed Van to be a better Zoid pilot, and he has the potential to be a really interesting character if they develop him a little more. That's about all for Chaotic Century. I've still got another half to review, but CubeSolver64, I'd like to thank you again for my first request, and also for introducing me to this series. After finishing Chaotic Century, I changed my mind. I'm glad I didn't see this until I was an adult. I mentioned that, for a show aimed at children, Zoids is pretty dark, and I don't think I could have fully appreciated that as a child. I guess the only downfall is that I don't have quite the nostalgia for it that I'm sure a lot of viewers do. So I hope to get the review for Guardian Force up in a timely manner, though that may require a little luck now that school has started again, but I am enjoying it so far. Thank you for watching.